You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Hello there, this is George Martin, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. And tonight, we are exploring the life of John Lennon, one of the most influential characters of the 1960s and 70s, through a new biography of him entitled John Lennon A Life, written by Philip Norman. Like most of us, John Lennon was a man of contradictions. He was loved the world over, and yet misunderstood by the millions that idolized him. Building on more than three years of in-depth, exhaustive research and exclusive interviews, award-winning novelist and biographer Philip Norman's controversial biography is one that I had to read each and every one of its 800-plus pages, all except I didn't read the entire index. The book is called John Lennon. The Life, published by Echo Press, an imprint of Harper and Collins. Philip Norman is an award-winning novelist and biographer who, in 1969-70, to 70, was assigned to cover from the inside the breakup of the Beatles' own business utopia called Apple Corps. He is the author of Shout, The Beatles in Their Generation, Rave On, The Biography of Buddy Holly, I wish I would have read that one, and many other books, and he lives in London. Welcome to 21st Century Radio. Thank you very much. Music was in Lennon's family going back to his paternal grandfather, Jack, or John Lennon, and his father, Alf, or Freddie Lennon. Tell us a little bit about their involvement in music and entertaining. Yes, uh, of course, in those days, music was considered, uh, you know, a sort of amateur pastime for people, you know, families, uh, their get-togethers would play and sing. But professional musicians were a very small and rather elite group of people and, you know, went through long, long training, professional training. So, um, you know, people, when they hadn't got TV and hadn't got radio, they would sing and play instruments. Uh, John Lennon's grandfather, who was also called John Lennon, whom he never knew, uh, actually uh, was uh, in a minstrel troupe that had gone to America and joined. And these were really the first kind of international pop acts. They were troops in which people blackened their faces and pretended to be black artists. They were white, very sort of patronizing rather racist form of music, was still very, very popular in those years. John's father, Alf, was a real sort of performer. He was on the ships as a steward on a merchant ship's li- uh, luxury liners. But to none of these people after John's grandfather did it occur to have think of music as a career. It was a pastime. Well, it certainly was so-called in his genes then. It was absolutely in his bones, but um, it, w- it would never have happened really had not, uh, first of all, American rock and roll come along, and then the skiffle music, which was American folk music, with a peculiarly English kind of slant, which showed young men who really had given up the sort of oral tradition of singing and performing, that they could get up on a stage and be musicians. Well, I want to stay a little bit here with John's uh, background and family before we get into his actual writing and work. John felt that he was never really wanted. What led to his belief that he had been abandoned by those in his family? Well, he grew up in the care of his aunt, Mimi, without his father and his mother being, you know, in his life as parents. But in fact, uh, in many ways, he had a very secure upbringing. His aunt Mimi doted on him and gave him everything, you know, that a child could want. In the 1950s, a very secure home, regular meals, a great sense of security in every way. But John felt that he had been abandoned by his father and then, to some extent, by his mother. His father, Alf, had wanted to take John himself and emigrate to New Zealand from Liverpool. But John's mother, Julia, uh, appeared and took John back. She was then rather pressured by her sister, Mimi, to hand John over to Mimi. But Julia, John's mother, was still in his life. And he saw her all through his childhood. But she, she had a, a man friend by whom she had two daughters. And so John really felt she wasn't his properly, his mum. But she was still around. But she was not like a mother figure, not like a maternal figure. So he felt that he hadn't been wanted. In fact, lots of people did want him. A lot of people were trying to adopt John and take him over. In his early childhood, he was very much sought after by lots of people. But he grew up with that feeling of, yes, rejection. Well, I really appreciated your going through uh, the difficulty that Freddie had. Alf, and then later on Freddie had, and and bringing it to a conclusion, it sure was sad near the end there. But I'll let our listeners uh, take a take a look for themselves and take a read on that one. That was thoroughly done. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing I I think uh, Philip that very few other Beatle researchers do, and that's one of the reasons why I thought this was such an extraordinary work. And 
Thank you. I mean, I, I felt that, you know, over the years, <clears throat> John's father has had a very, very bad press. Yeah. Um, and John didn't really sort of put the record straight because he did not want to detract from the achievement of his aunt Mimi in yeah. raising him, which mm -hmm. she did with a great sacrifice to herself. Yeah. Um, he didn't want to sort of just take any of the glory from Mimi. But his mother was important in his life, and his father was not such a bad man. Uh, during the war, he was away a lot, but of course he was in the Merchant Navy, and a lot of the Liverpudlian men were, were in the North Atlantic convoys, going undergoing great dangers. Uh, it was crucial war work, in fact. But his father really wasn't such a... His father was a bit feckless and liked to drink and liked laughing a bit too much, you know. But he's had a terrible sort of um, write-up over the years. Yeah, he certainly has. And by the way, friends, I wanted to mention that on the back of the fly of this book, uh, John Lennon and the Life, is uh, praise from a friend of mine, Bill Harry. He said this... Reading this book brings the John Lennon I knew vividly back to life. Bill Harry really knew Brother John. Uh, he was an art school classmate of John and founder of Mercy Beat, and I'm so glad that I saw that as the very top of the, uh, the those who really have enjoyed this work. Now, again, here's a lot of stuff that I've not, had no idea before concerning Liverpool. You note that the fortunes in Liverpool were made in the slave trade, or some of the fortunes were. Uh, how did this come about, and how did this also link Liverpool to the support of the South in America's Civil War? Well, Liverpool always felt close to America, and uh, yes, Liverpool really, you know, the rest of England was very uneasy about the American Civil War, but Liverpool was pretty sort of unequivocally on the side of the South because of the connection with the cotton trade, the international cotton trade, and southern warships were built in Liverpool, and in fact, the last southern battleship to surrender did not surrender to the northern, to the federal side. The skipper sailed the Atlantic and surrendered to the Lord Mayor of Liverpool. The Confederate embassy has never been officially closed in Liverpool, and this carried over later on because of the uh, all the big transatlantic liners that originated in Liverpool, the men who crewed those boats felt very close to America. They brought back lots of uh, exotic things from America that the rest of the country hadn't seen. And in time, this included music, records that were not available anywhere else in Britain were brought back into Liverpool by what used to be called the Cunard Yanks, who were these Liverpudlians who worked on the Cunard liners. There are so many things, Philip, that that you introduced me to in this book. To tell you the truth, out of the dozens of books that I've read about them, none of them seems to be on this level from the standpoint of, of in-depth research. I felt it was important to sort of go back to the beginning and, and not assume anyone knew anything about John Lennon or mm -hmm. Liverpool or the 1950s or rock and roll. I think that's the best way with a biography. You start with a clean slate. People who know about it don't mind seeing the world created in front of their eyes. Those who don't know about it, of course, you know, that, that needs to be done for them. Yeah, it certainly did. Well, it had to be for me, and if it had to be for me, I'm sure there are many other Americans who would feel the same way. John loved to read. Again, here's another area that I just love learning about. Who were some of his favorite authors, and what were some of his favorite books? Well, his Aunt Mimi was a very intelligent woman. In fact, she had four sisters, and they were all extremely intelligent. But Mimi could have gone to university and could have been a doctor or a lawyer, except she went in for matrimony and eventually ended up bringing up John. So her bookshelves were full of the English classics. John was incredibly well-read by a very early age, even though he always said he was a dunce at school. In fact, his English reports from school were brilliant. He was a star English student at school, and his exercise book was kept by one teacher to show to other boys to say you should aspire to this standard because he would illustrate write bits of poetry and then illustrate them wonderfully well he loved this um the adventures of this 11 year old boy called william sometimes called just william uh, who was created in the 1920s by a female author who had no children actually it was all based on a rather sort of uh, scamp of a brother that she had and this William has so many characteristics. John modeled his life really on just William. William loved putting on shows. He liked putting mustaches on his face. He liked singing and performing. He, has, he was tremendously eloquent. He misspelled words in a funny way. And he had three friends, and they were called the outlaws. These four went around terrorizing the rest of the neighborhood. And in a way, the Beatles were like John's version of William's outlaws, three others. Yeah, you, you maintain that through the entire book from various sections. Was that Rich, I can't, never seen this name before, Rich Mall? Rich Mall Crompton. Rich Mall Crompton. Um, in fact, yes, Rich Mall Crompton were two surnames, but 
she was a school teacher who got polio um, and couldn't go on teaching and turned to writing and created this uh, character not for a, ch a children's audience, for grown-ups. They were rather facetious stories, sort of supposed to be satirizing children. But children loved them because they were full of long words. John loved long words you see, and language. So precocious children liked just William's stories. Uh, and you also mentioned uh, his interest in uh, Jonathan Swift, Tennyson, Huxley, Orwell. My God. Uh, he really read everything. And, and late on in life, late on in his life, when he's sort of, you know, knocking on for 40 and wants to have a sort of open marriage with Yoko Ono, his second wife, Yoko. Um, his model for this is a literary figure, Harold Nicholson and V. Sackville West, these two very, very literary figures in the British uh, literary scene in the 1930s and 40s, who both of whom were homosexual. They had an open marriage, but they still had a very happy marriage. And John turned to the story of Nicholson and Sackville West, convince Yoko that this is what they should do. So that's how learned John was. He also read everything in all the newspapers. He knew everything that was going on. He pretended to be dozy, you know, and half awake, but he knew everything that was going on. Well, I think we better start with the singing career here, even though there are so many other things to touch on here. The Quarrymen was John's first group, and from the beginning, John had adopted a certain physical posture that I had no idea where that posture came from, but you do, obviously, and others did. Uh, would you describe that posture and why he It was he quite aggressive. It? Uh, it was his head thrust forward and legs apart, which sort of lasted into the Beatles as well. If you see John, the way he stands on stage, it's very distinctive. But really, it was um, he was trying to focus. He was terribly short-sighted, nearsighted. He was trying to see, really, trying to get, get things in focus. But uh, this sort of staring expression that he had and this slightly sort of hunched posture made people think he was aggressive. Yeah. And later on, you had mentioned two or at least one of the other artists that stood in that way that he approved. I can't recall it right now. Yes. Um, it, another great influence on John was a, a singer called Tony Sheridan, who was the first kind of singer to play lead guitar in British popular pop music. Electric guitars were such a novelty in Britain in the late 50s. They weren't originally allowed to be played on television in case they shorted out the cameras and everything. But Tony Sheridan could play lead guitar and could sing. And John knew him in Hamburg, and they had a lot of adventures together. And Sheridan was very influential on John as a performer. When we return, we will find out what was even more influential on John Lennon, who he met when he went to art school, and the ideas they exposed him to. We'll find out who those people were after this short break. Don't go away. This is 21st Century Radio, and we're listening to an interview with John Lennon biographer Philip Norman. His 800-plus page book is out now from HarperCollins, entitled John Lennon, A Life. Hello, this is Alistair Taylor. I was general manager of the Beatles, and I loved 21st Century Radio, especially Dr. Bob Hieronymus. I met him, and it was a joy. We are now entering the stage in Lennon's life where John's creative spirit is about to be set free. Liverpool Art College. He, uh, he got into... Uh, how did he get into that? It wasn't easy. Well, it was a miracle because he, he didn't really leave school with any qualifications, but art schools in that time, were very sort of relaxed places where boys, in, boys and girls went there, but in particular, rather sort of renegade boys, not only John Lennon, but Keith Richards, who would later be in the Rolling Stones. Other uh, misfits in schools, in the school system, went to, because they had a vaguely arty streak, they went to art college. In fact, the British art colleges of the late 50s were a sort of breeding ground for the rock and roll of the 60s. And the one in Liverpool just took John in, really, and was willing to take a chance. Although, again, John always said he was no good. It was just a soft option to be able to play his music and sort of live a, a fairly easy life for a couple of years. But actually, his art teachers thought he was very, very good and could have made a career in, in something. Most of art students became art teachers in Britain in those days, but mm -hmm. you know, John could have maybe gone on to be something else. Well, it was very fortunate that one of his teachers, Arthur Ballard, made that accidental discovery of finding one of his notebooks. Yes, full of cartoons yeah. and stuff like that. But in fact, he did more than do cartoons. You know, he could do a wonderful sort of continuous line sketch, rather sort of based on the way Matisse used to draw. It was more than just a cartoon. Well, two other classmates, Stuart Sutcliffe and Bill Harry, were also uh, with John at Liverpool Art College. How, how did they free John's creative spirit? Well, Stuart Sutcliffe was a really brilliant artist, a 
sculptor, painter. And he, he was precociously talented, and he was incredibly productive. And he was very intellectual. I mean, an intellectual artist is something quite rare, someone could, who can explain what they're doing. There are very few of them. David Hockney is the great example, I suppose. Sutcliffe really knew what he was doing, and he recognized something in John. And John really did hero worship Stuart Sutcliffe. Um, then Stuart joined the Beatles uh, because the Beatles needed a bass player. They needed to make up their numbers to stop being just a little skiffle group, as they had been. Stuart won a prize for a painting, and John persuaded him to invest in this big bass guitar. Bass guitars were a big novelty then as well in the UK. But Stuart really couldn't play this. His hands were very small. The bass was very big and heavy. He was rather slight in stature. So he really was never good on the bass guitar in, the, in what became the Beatles. So John was impatient with him for his musicianship, but still Hero worshipped him for his art. So there was this oddly divided sort of mm -hmm. way John behaved towards Stuart. He could be really horrible to him, or he could, be, yeah. he could revere him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So they also introduced him to authors Cellini, Herbert Reed, James Joyce, Kierkegaard, and Dada, which is uh, something I've enjoyed a great deal in my life. This group, Sutcliffe, Harry, John, and there was one other individual whose name escapes me at this time, called themselves the Dissenters. Yes. Uh, um, the, what was their purpose, the, the Dissenters? Their purpose was really to sort of, they wanted to stop the reliance on totally on American culture. They wanted Liverpool to have its own voice in the same way that the Beat Poets came to sort of put San Francisco on the map so much in the 50s in America. This didn't last for very long, actually, because American culture was too much, too addictive for John. But they would sit around, you know, and have philosophical discussions. John is always a contradiction here. John gets drunk with some of his mates and smashes up the telephone boxes. But other nights, he's sitting around with Bill, Harry and Stuart talking about Dada, yes, and, you know, very involved concepts of philosophy. So you can never pin John down. You know, he, he's always a contradiction. Well, there are several theories of how John's band came to be known as the Beatles, spelled B-E-A-T-L-E-S. What do you believe is the real source of the spelling of the Beatles' name? It went through a, a lot of changes, and beat was um, on beat music and sort of affected by the beat poets. There was a film called The Wild One with Marlon Brando where the motorcycle gang that beats up a town are called the Beatles, B-E-E-T-L-E-S. -E -E they hadn't seen that film. They were thinking of Buddy Holly's Crickets, which was a nice little sort of chirpy insect name. For a while, they were called the Beat Alls, B-E-A-T-A-L-S, in the sense of beating all competition. But finally, it became Beatles. And in fact, the credit seems to belong to Stuart Sutcliffe originally, but it was a sort of slow mutation. Like, a, like an insect coming out of a chrysalis, really. Yeah. If we would have uh, taken the Beatles anthology as being the source of knowing where that information came from, this totally would have been lost. Well, yes. Uh, you know, it, it's like a, any great famous name. There are, success has many fathers. Failure is an orphan. Yeah. Hamburg. Oh, boy. You taught me a lot about hamburger. Philip... <laughs> It's, it's really obviously embarrassing for me to say how much I don't know, but boy, you really did fill in my education in these areas. Hamburger's Reaper Bomb was one of the world's earliest experiments in sex therapy. How, how had it come to be that way? Well, in Britain, uh, the, the, I mean, Britain was a very repressed country, and Philip Larkin you know, said that sex didn't start till 1963. Um, and, uh, that's not true. Where, um, really? <laughs> yeah, but, but that's not true. But still, the British looked to other European cities as places of great sexual liberation. There was Paris, of course. But Hamburg had this notorious red light district where you're supposed to see all kinds of things done in public that were hardly done in private elsewhere. And the philosophy was, if, if you have an area where all that is available, then people will go there and it will be open and above board and it will cut down on sexual misdemeanors outside the borders of that particular enclave. Mm. And it seemed to work in, in some ways. Um, but, of course, it was a very extreme place after Liverpool. They were playing in, not in strip clubs so much, as in drink, big drinking clubs, enormous bars. But then they would themselves would go to strip clubs after work. And they were playing very long hours as well. And they were all pretty innocent lads. They weren't virgins. They, they'd never seen anything like you could see in Hamburg. It was a sexual ed education. 
But it was also musical education because they really had to keep playing hour after hour. And this forged them into a really professional group where they hadn't been very good. Back in Liverpool, they'd been very low down the league table in Liverpool. Hamburg really made them performers. You say that according to the myth, it was Hamburg that produced the first serious growth spurt in Lennon and McCartney's songwriting partnership. What kind of music did they really play in Hamburg? They really played cover, cover version. They had, they had to play cover versions of everything under the sun. I mean, not just, you know, old show tunes, old movie themes, instrumentals, pop tunes out of the top ten, all the old rock and roll stuff, all the B-sides, all the sort of unknown rock stuff like Chan Romero's Hippie Hippie Shake that they would never have heard if it hadn't been for somebody brought a copy over on a, on a liner from New York to Liverpool. These Liverpool groups knew these songs that no one else in Britain really knew who was playing rock at that time. So it was really, they started putting in the odd Lennon McCartney composition. John and Paul started writing together at a very early stage in their friendship. But it wasn't until quite a bit later, even once they started being the Beatles, they were still putting out albums with, you know, cover versions of other other people's material. Mm -hmm. Because it still wasn't certain that Lennon and McCartney were just what the public wanted. That took time. Yeah, it certainly did, especially when we get to Sir George Martin a little later on. I I find out another thing I learned was that he had an ulterior motive in some of the things he was doing. Most... I never would <laughs> I never would have guessed that. Now, one of the reasons for the Beatles enjoying themselves uh, in Hamburg was their introduction to uh, the beatniks and existentialists such as Klaus Vormann and Astrid Kirchner. But what effect did Astrid have on the Beatles? She sort of treated them as art objects, really. She photographed them in this very moody, sort of shadowy way. And it wasn't just her effect on the Beatles. I mean, it was her effect on pop culture because the template for a young group of pop outlaws, turned up leather jackets, teddy boy hair, grease back hair, cowboy boots. That is what pop groups look, want to look like today. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. a, for all time. She created the image of the pop group. But of course, the Beatles, they, they had a sort of innocence about them as well, as being, you know, quite wicked in other ways. And this was the quality that comes across in her photographs, you know, these very innocent young lads looking like outlaws. Was she solely responsible for their haircuts? That again... Um, The the haircut came gradually. Mm -hmm. Uh, Boys on the continent did cut their hair across their forehead, French boys in particular. It had been around in continental Europe for a while. But of course in Britain, it was still considered to be, you know, two way out. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the Beatles gradually introduced it, and it was in Hamburg. And then later on, a couple of them, John and Paul, met a friend of their German friend in Paris. And they finally went for this hairdo. But when the Beatles first became famous, their hair was such an issue. But, of course, you look at it today, it looks very short and hygienic. (laughs) Yes, it does. (laughs) Well, uh, sticking with this particular area of existentialism, what effect did existentialism have on the Beatles? The German smart set called themselves exes after existentialism. You know, they weren't reading Sartre, uh, Albert Camus. uh, It was just a look, really can't say that any of them really knew what existentialism was, but it was just this sort of austere, black, leathery look uh, with very white faces, um, which was so appealing to the Beatles, you know, which in the end they kind of took into, they, they made the, the, the fashion in, in the UK. Mm-hmm. The Exes were not too deeply uh, amorous uh, of rock and roll, but they were more involved with jazz, and of course, uh, uh, this is another inc- interesting line that, that you draw through the in- out your entire book, and that really... Well, they became, of course, the converted to rock and roll. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this was interesting because this was really very, very soon after the Second World War, and Hamburg had been bombed to ruins, huge devastation and death caused by um, the Allies in World War Two. Yet these young lads, a few years later, went to Hamburg, and it was like a peace mission, really. I mean, it was like John's first kind of peace campaign. He didn't know that at the time, because these German kids, and they love these British kids, and it was a kind of peacemaking mm-hmm. process. Coming up next, we will venture into some of the more controversial areas of this new biography on John Lennon, including the rumor that Lennon had something to do with the untimely death of his best friend, Stuart Sutcliffe. This is 21st Century Radio, and our guest is Philip Norman, author of John Lennon, A Life, available from HarperCollins. We'll be right back. You're listening to Bob Hieronymus. 
on 21st Century Radio, and I hope you enjoy the show. And this is John Clive, who once had the pleasure of playing John Lennon in Yellow Submarine. I hope you enjoy this from a good friend of Bob Peronowitz. Good night. One of the rumors that Philip Norman thoroughly lays to rest is the one that hounded Lennon for years, inferring that his violent temper may have contributed to the death of his friend Stuart Sutcliffe. Let's find out how the story got started. Well, there are some areas of controversy in your book that we should address first. Um, One deals with the death of Stuart Sutcliffe, who was involved in at least two physical fights. Uh, The first is with John Lennon. What are the circumstances surrounding that particular physical struggle that he had uh, with Stuart? Well, the mythology is that Stuart's death from a brain hemorrhage in 1960 which was just as the Beatles were about to sort of break through finally onto the national stage, might have resulted or directly or indirectly from an attack John made on him, allegedly, in Hamburg when John was supposed to have kicked him in the head. Now, John had actually come to Stuart's aid when he was being attacked in Liverpool some time before. John came to his defense so enthusiastically that John broke a finger. A finger really was never right afterwards, a little finger me it's inconceivable John would have done that. Um, the only witness to this alleged uh, attack by John on Stuart was Paul McCartney. And I just asked Paul McCartney point blank whether he saw it and he said he has no memory of it. So I, I really think we can discount it. But the um, what caused Stuart's death uh, and controversy surrounding the, the, the beating that you know, the struggle that John and he had against his attackers. Actually, that no, that was in Liverpool. Sorry. Yeah, that, uh, that was back in before. Both of these um, were. And there again, the injuries that Stuart sustained in that earlier attack, assault by these Liverpool uh, thugs, he seemed to get over that. Now, whether he did or not really get over it, we don't know. But certainly I don't think. I think there is no evidence. It, go, it flies in the face of all reason to say that John would have attacked Stuart. Why would he do it? The, the reason given is that he tired of Stuart's musical ineptitude in the Beatles, but actually, at the time it was alleged to have happened, this attack, Stuart was virtually out of the Beatles. His musicianship was no longer irrelevant. Of course, when Astrid uh, was asked about this, she said that actually John had saved her, and didn't she didn't believe uh, that he had anything really to do with the... Well, Astrid said that if, if that really had happened, Stuart would have told her, and he didn't. Didn't she say... That John saved her from... That was in the sort of grief that she yeah, felt, because Stuart and Astor were engaged to be mm-hmm. married. And John would really kept... Her, Beatles had arrived to play another season in Hamburg, just as Stuart died. So John was around for several weeks after his death. And Astor just said she, when she was, you know, give in to grief, really, John sort of helped her tremendously and talked to her and said, you've got to live your life. You're young. Mm-hmm. You've got to go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the second more controversial theory you review is that John Lennon may have dabbled in or at least considered dabbling in homosexual relationships with Brian Epstein or Paul McCartney or maybe others. Would you please give us your reasons why John may have considered being gay or was uh, a practicing homosexual? No, John was uh, totally heterosexual, and, uh, but he knew you know, he was a, a clever and intuitive person. He knew that Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, adored him. Brian was too embarrassed, too decent, too nice to come on to him. A bit afraid of John as well. Although, um, apparently, John told Yoko that right at the beginning he had said to Brian, look, if, it, you know, if, if I sleep with you, if that's going to make you manage the Beatles better, I'll do it. Brian refused to take advantage of that. So John was prepared to use sexuality and certainly you know, was not above using it to sort of express a degree of power over Brian Epstein, but he, what, he was not homosexual. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a time when he thought that he should be a real artist, and real artists were open to every experience. And he, again, told Yoko that at a certain stage he wondered if, to be a real artist, he should have a homosexual affair, see what it was like. The only person on, on his horizon, really, at that time was Paul McCartney, but it was obvious that it wouldn't work because Paul absolutely, uh, you know, 100% always was uh, heterosexual. Mm-hmm. So it was just a thought, who should I, if I did, who would it be with? Would it be with Paul? No. Well, even if, even if the, he was or had any tendency, what of what importance uh, would that possibly be of being gayness in regards to, to what John has left us? Well, uh, 
none at all, except you have to put it into context and realize till 1967 in Britain, a homosexuality, homosexual love between, between men was illegal. You could be locked up for it. You could be prosecuted. You could be humiliated. Your life could be ruined. So it, it was important up to 1967. Also, John himself, you know, had a teasing sort of nature later on, would say to Yoko, oh, that young musician's really beautiful. If I, you know, if I was going to have an affair with anyone, any man, it would be with him. So John would play around, but um, it was really, it was playfulness. Well, let's go to Sir George Martin. Sir George, well, he was just George Martin in those days. He said he had a secret agenda when he auditioned the Beatles. What was that? The famous group at the time was Cliff Ridge and the Shadows. The Shadows were very polite very restrained, very disciplined instrumental group who used to do a little dance in unison behind Cliff Richard, who was, had the ultimate clean-cut young pop star. Another label inside the EMI stable, Columbia, had Cliff Richard and the Shadows, and George Martin with Parlophone label did comedy records. Every comedy record had to be begun afresh. You had to conceive it, have the idea, get the performers. It was a big struggle every time. But according to Martin, it was, as far as he knew, Cliff Richard and the Shadows just were like on a conveyor belt. They'd walk into the studio and do six tracks, and there'd be six hits. So Martin wanted an, his own Cliff Richard and the Shadows. So he was wondering who he should make the leader of the, of the group. Should it be John or should it be Paul? To his credit, however, he realized that the great strength of the Beatles, that they were all in it. You know, it was a democracy. Yeah. They shared the lead vocals. They all did harmonies. And so he realized that was the way they had to be on record. Well, Sir George Martin, you refer to as the greatest altruist, and the other being uh, Brian, uh, the most all-around gentleman in pop music history. Now, Sir George uh, topped a recent poll as the best producer of all time and was recently honored in Ireland with the James Joyce Award for, from the University College of Dublin's Literary and Historical Society. Yet, John had a tendency, especially later in his life, to, to kind of shortchange George. The way that George Martin could have cheated them and ripped them off and exploited them, the ways were innumerable. Um, he could have insisted that his name went on their songs, Lennon, McCartney, Martin, because the producers did that. He could have... Uh, uh, there were so many ways he could have exploited them, but he didn't. He simply confined himself to being an editor, to bringing out the best in what they were doing, to turning the rough diamonds into beautiful, perfectly cut gems, introducing them to all kinds of new instrumentation, they were completely intuitive and un, untutored in music. George Martin was a classically trained musician, and he taught them really so much about music, about things you could do with music, about recording. He had all these wonderful ideas for improving their music, and he just simply stayed on salary, which wasn't very high, awesome. from EMI for a long, long time. And he was producing the other Liverpool acts as well. One year he had, I don't know how many records in the top ten in the year. It was dozens. And EMI told him he didn't qualify for the Christmas bonus. How <laughs> oh, pathetic. I mean, yeah. there's some pathetic things about EMI, but that's one of them. Well, it was a big bureaucracy, but, you know, like the BBC or like General Motors used to oh. build something yeah. like that. Later on, John kind of turned against his life as a Beatle. And he, yes, he, when they were making the album that finally became Let It Be, he said this has got to be a real album with no artifice. No, sort of, you know, none of George Martin's studio tricks. Well, of course, it didn't work. They needed George Martin. However, later on, very much later on, you know, just a few months before John's death, he had dinner with George Martin, and Martin said, well, why did you say those things? John, John said, I was out of my head, you know. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. John would always apologize many years later, but he would apologize. But he also said that... Um, Despite all of the brilliant things that Martin had done with the Beatles, John was never really that pleased with any of them. John was never satisfied. This is a mark of a great creative spirit, of course, never to be pleased with yourself. John told George Martin he would like to re-record everything yeah. the Beatles had oh. done with Martin. Martin said, what do you mean, even Strawberry Fields? And John said, especially Strawberry Fields. So even that totally brilliant track, John was not really happy with. Well, let's touch a little bit more on Brian Epstein. You note that... Uh all that set apart the Beatles and a hundred other pop acts with half a hit was the tireless dedication and sheer chutzpah of their manager. Then later on, you note that Brian didn't do so well in regarding 
the marketing of the Beatles and the films, the granting of merchandise uh, licenses. Could you review that for us, please? There was no precedent for this, the Beatles. Uh, the only precedent probably was sort of Disney and Mickey Mouse, you know, the marketing possibilities that existed. Just in the sort of merchandising, there were Beatle wigs and there were Beatle cookies and you know, Beatle badges and Beatle plastic guitars. But particularly in America, huge manufacturing effort geared up. Brian really didn't sort of appreciate the magnitude of it. And a lot of merchandising contracts were sort of went astray and were cancelled because the manufacturers didn't know if Brian had actually given them a bona fide contract because there was another company also issuing licenses. So millions and millions of dollars were lost. One can't calculate how much. But at the same time, in the long term, of course, the Beatles are the greatest sort of money-making, great money-making concerns in the world. So Brian did the right thing in the long run. And of course, Brian, what Brian really did was to make them feel safe and protected so that their creative brilliance could, could really flourish. That was what he did. They didn't have to worry. Brian took care of everything. They could concentrate on playing music, writing songs. Well, in regards to the Beatles' first trip to America and whether they would be successful or not, John believed, quote, we didn't think we stood a chance, end quote. What led him to think that? Well, because every other British pop act had gone to America and had really not done that well. I mean, they might have had one, possibly one hit as a freak occurrence. But when they went over there, they, they were pretty, you know, they were drowned by the sort of talent that was in America. And the Beatles thought the same was going to happen. And it wasn't a big deal. This wasn't really a tour, their first visit. They were going to do some appearances. They'd been booked in Carnegie Hall. They were going to do the Ed Sullivan Show. But you know, a lot of British acts had done the Ed Sullivan Show before. They had no idea that this enormous wave of hysteria was going to break over them when they reached New York. You noted that Cliff Richard did not have a successful time coming to America. What do you think his problem was there? What you already said? You know, America thought for many, many years that America was where rock and roll started. Americans were the best at playing rock and roll. And everything that came back to them from Europe was a kind of bad imitation of American music. What the Beatles brought was something else. It was kind of charm and cheekiness and eccentricity and funny clothes. You know, in a lot of American minds, they were sort of confused with Shakespeare. You know, their the clothes were called Hamlet outfits. Hmm. And all the sort of American sort of fascination with the old country and the old world, as well as rock and roll, came in with the Beatles. And from British groups not being able to succeed in America, suddenly you couldn't succeed unless you were British or you sounded British. And even American bands mm -hmm. had to start trying to sound British, the bizarre twist. Well, that reminds me of something that uh, I wanted to clarify here, that, that the accent... The accent that the Beatles assumed in their rise to fame, uh, was that a genuine accent of theirs? Because I do recall Mimi saying to John Lennon, you know, what are you talking like that for? Oh, yes. Jo John wasn't allowed uh, as a small boy to speak with a Liverpool, you know, the very distinctive, guttural Liverpool accent. But And really, he only started sort of laying it on thick once he was in the Beatles and everyone was charmed with this Liverpudlian voice. Yes, Mimi saw him on television and said, why are you talking that funny way, John? And John admitted to her that he was putting it on, putting on the Beatles accent, putting on the Liverpool accent. Uh, was that true with the other Beatles? Not with George Harrison. George and Ringo, you know, came from pretty sort of, you know, blue-collar families. And they, they, they were genuine. Paul had a more sort of light, sort of slightly aspirant middle-class accent because his mother had been a nurse. And for some curious reason the British class system as it used to be. Nurses were thought to be middle class more than working class. Mm -hmm. Nurses were just a sort of special race. And so um, even though they lived on a council, like a project, you know, uh, estate, he and his brother spoke with nicer accents than the other children. When we come back after the news, we'll address the indisputable impact of Yoko Ono on the life of John Lennon. Just wait till you hear what biographer Philip Norman says about John's possibly inherited psychic abilities or... John also had a mind-blowing, up-close-and-personal UFO sighting, which occurred on August the 23rd, 1974, at 9 p.m. The setting was the small penthouse of the Tower Apartments on East 52nd Street, overlooking New York City's East River. He was lying naked on the bed, and as he turned his head, hovering over the next building, no more than a hundred feet away, 
was this thing, he said. Uh, the hair on the back of his head stood up. And, of course, that's a long-time associated UFO phenomenon in itself. According to May Pang, she had just stepped out of the shower when she heard John scream for her. He was standing naked on the terrace of the apartment, looking toward the sky and pointing. It was, she estimated, about the size of a Learjet, and it was so close that if we had something to throw at it, then we probably would have hit it. The UFO, which had a dark metallic color, floated silently less than a hundred feet away from that particular couple. Good old John and Yoko. No, John and May. <laughs> yes. The object went past the United Nations Plaza building, which uh, houses many UN delegates, slowly turned left and crossed over the East River and eventually headed in the direction of Brooklyn, where my daughter lives now. Yeah, disappearing from view. John shouted to the UFO, quote, Stop! Take me with you! Then they both went inside. Quote, I almost didn't call you to go outside, John confessed to May. I was afraid you wouldn't believe me. I thought you would say, What is John on? I didn't think anyone would believe me. The rest of that night, John kept repeating, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I've seen a flying saucer. John and May were in total shock. And he had other UFO experiences besides this that we covered when we talked about them in uh, Michael Luckman's book, Alien Rock. Now, you know, when we get back uh, next hour, not only are we going to continue with Philip Norman, John Lennon, The Life uh, by Harper, Harper Collins, but also... We're going to have Sir George Martin, who we've had five uh, interviews with. All of them were not given to the rest of the media, so they were kind of like just ours alone. We'll be back next hour. Hello, I'm Louise Harrison. I've just written a book called My Kid Brother's Band, also known as The Beatles. I hope you may enjoy it. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Cheerio. This is the final segment of our interview with Philip Norman, author of a new and slightly controversial biography called John Lennon, A Life, from HarperCollins. We open this hour with one of numerous songs John wrote about his mother, Julia, whose lack of involvement in his childhood wounded him deeply, despite the kind and caring upbringing he received from his Aunt Mimi. Before we get into that, or how it was mirrored in his later relationship with Yoko Ono, we're going to hear about the -the behind-the-scenes beat Beatles that no one ever talked about during their establishment of their engaging, mop-top, charming image that took the world by storm. There were some things uh, that the reporters were just not allowed to write about when traveling with the Beatles. Uh, can you tell us anything about that without embarrassing everybody? Uh, well, not really embarrassing because everyone, <laughs> know, knows, <laughs> everyone knows now how <laughs> pop groups behave on the road. Yes, they um, do, yeah. The Beatles were remarkably well-behaved. They did not trash hotel rooms. They were not rude and horrible um, or violent. But, you know, they still uh, behaved very differently offstage from these cheeky, charming mop tops who were on stage as they went around the country. Um, Female company, they weren't quite groupies then. Quite often, they would be paid female company for them in their hotel suite. There would be a kind of attached, embedded press corps going with them who knew all about this, but of course couldn't write it because nobody in the world wanted to hear that the Beatles were, you know, consorting with call girls. Mm -hmm. So um, they were like Edwardian servants in English country houses, you know. They saw what the aristocracy were doing, but they couldn't talk about it except to one another. If they had, what would have happened? Well, everybody only wanted charm from the Beatles. It would would never have been printed in any newspaper or broadcast Mm -hmm. um, in those days. There was not the kind of celebrity culture. It was not the paparazzi that we have now. So quite a lot could go on with no coverage at all, no press coverage at all. You know, the Beatles could be private. Quite a lot of their time, particularly in London, around the clubs where the the young celebrities went, they weren't paparazzi hanging outside the door. They really could have a private life. Well, another area in this book, and there are many that I learned so much from, is is that you certainly changed my attitude and mind about Yoko Ono. Well, I'm glad because, you know, Yoko has been subjected to a lot of very unpleasant abuse. There's been a lot of um, untrue things that have been written and said about her over the years, that she broke up the Beatles, that she dominated John and took him in a weird direction he shouldn't really have gone in. None of this is true. 
Yoko is a complex character, and she had a profound effect on John, but I think it, she was the person for John. She was the person he'd always wanted to meet, in a way, and the person that he, he really needed to be with to sort of unlock the creativity that was inside him, not just music, but art, and writing, yeah. everything. Yeah, as you said, Yoko Ono is the woman that was destined to transform the rest of John's life. I really do hope that she realizes how much your book has uh, reintroduced to many Americans uh, a, a more positive side of this. <clears throat> I, I mean, I think so, and I hope so. And although she initially said she wanted to dissociate herself from the book, I hear now that she sort of slightly changed her attitude because she always said to me that I'd been fair and just to her. Right, um, yeah. And I think I'm fair, fair and just to John. I mean, why would I not be to John, and why would I be to Yoko? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of um, course. So, yeah. I agree with you. It's, I just and in particular in Britain, the, the racism was really horrible. Um, there were still memories of the Second World War and the Japanese prisoner of war camps in the Far East, and Yoko was subjected to dreadful racial abuse in Britain, uh, not just by the fans of the Beatles, but by the media. And it was okay in those days. There was nothing like political correctness as there is today. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about her family that influenced her persona? She came from a, a very, very wealthy uh, family, um, the Yasuda family, enormously influential, um, huge business house that they had. Yoko wanted to be an artist and rather sort of rejected, was rather a rebel, really. And she left. She was extremely intelligent, studied classical music, apart from other things, at school and college, and really turned her back on this extraordinary um, extraordinarily privileged background to go to New York and become a sort of Greenwich Village artist, really, and live in a cold water apartment. Well, you also state that Yoko was the epitome of the Fluxus Multimedia Anti Art. Could you tell yes, us a little bit about that? The Fluxus group, um, she aligned herself to some extent with this group, and they. They felt that art, the public must engage with art at all costs, even if it is simply to deride it and to think that the artist is crazy. That is still engagement with art. Now today, this is completely familiar to all of us in the mainstream of culture. Artists like Tracy Emin or Damien Hirst have brought this completely into everyone's consciousness. But in those days, Yoko was doing the same kind of thing, and particularly events where people would be invited to witness something extraordinary, usually starring Yoko, like having bits of her dress cut until she was in her underwear or something like that. Um, everyone said she was mad. Now, nowadays, the young artists revere her. Yeah. Well, after, after John sees a photo of Yoko's great-grandfather, and I might mispronounce it, but the Sen Zenjiro Yasuda, yes. uh, he said, quote, that's me in a formal life, end quote. And she said, don't say that, because he was assassinated. Do you think that John might have to mention that, which you did? Uh, you know, having we've done scores of shows in the area of uh, reincarnation and the paranormal, etc. Yeah. And the patterns, if you can pay any attention to the great work that was done down at University of Virginia by our friends down there who are now ceased, Dr. Ian Stevenson and others, there are patterns from one life to the next, and this would be one of those kind of patterns. Uh, well, John, uh, John's grandmother, who he hardly ever saw, his Lenin grandmother, was supposed to have been a psychic. And uh, John himself had moments, strangely, sort of, you could say moments of second sight. Around 1963, he had an, an affair with a, this woman in London who lived in the apartment below his apartment in West London. He was living with Cynthia, his first wife. And he told this woman that he thought he was going to die young and yeah. be shot. Mm -hmm. At a time when there was not a, you never saw a gun in the United Kingdom, you know, it was guns were only in Western movies. Even when he first met Cynthia and said, do you want to dance? And she said, she blurted out, oh, I've got a boyfriend. And he said, I didn't ask you to marry me, did I? <laughs> um, now that's a very small example, but yeah. still, he was always very interested in Ouija boards and seances and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if a bit of his sort of grandmother's clairvoyance may be Got through to him. Yeah, it seems reasonable to me, but then I guess being the kind of person I am, is I'm not so reasonable. And as we're winding down here, and I know you've got a limited time, I did want to mention, ask about this uh, and a few other little things here. How was Ringo the glue that held the Beatles together? Well, he was someone that John really liked. John thought he was genuine and honest and sweet, and so he could always sort of calm John down. And in fact, if you remember the famous occasion in the Washington, British Embassy in Washington, 1964, when John makes 
a terrible scene. It's all because some silly woman has cut a bit of Ringo's hair with some nail scissors. You know, he feels Ringo has been insulted. He, after the Beatles split up, John told people that if Ringo was ever in need, he, John, would always see Ringo was all right financially. Well, Ringo was always going to be all right anyway. So John really adored Ringo and felt there was no pretense with him. And, and it was just a calming influence. Uh, he w didn't have an enormous talent, but he was just very sweet, and he sort of stayed very sweet, actually, until quite recently, and now he's not very sweet. You know, he was just a wonderful stabilizing influence within them, within the four. Uh, when you mentioned more recently that he's not as sweet as he used to be, what do you think brought that on? I just think it's sort of years and years of everyone kowtowing to him, and he just has forgotten how lucky he was, and he should not do that to the people who still are interested in him, Beatles fans. Mm -hmm. You should not treat people like that. John would never have done that. Paul McCartney would never do it. I think Rico should remember that. Now, what did John mean when he said that if the Beatles or the 60s had a message, it was to learn to swim? I think it was the feeling you know, of liberation that the 60s um, brought to so many young people in Britain and in America and ultimately all over the world, and particularly in Britain where... It was, the 50s were so grey and boring, the 60s were so full of colour and so full of apparent opportunity for young people. They were not under the, the thumb of the older generation anymore. Ultimately, we know the 60s didn't change very much uh, in the long term, and the world was not in a good state at the end of the 60s anymore than it was at the end of the 50s. But it just was a period of tremendous joy and optimism. Of course, that was so much epitomised by the Beatles and so much, in a way, by John. A great breakthrough uh, for John came when he underwent primal scream therapy. How did it help John and Yoko? It certainly helped John because uh, Arthur Yanov, when he arrived in Britain to, to give this therapy to John, said he had never seen anyone with so much pain inside them in all his years of practice as a, ther as a therapist. John was unbelievably hurt by his childhood. He never got over it. He was still carrying it around, the memory of his mother, the feeling of loss. His mother had been killed when he was in his teens. He was just getting to sort of appreciate her as a person. And he had a kind of quasi-sexual fascination with her as well. He was always turning up in his songs, her name, references to her. And uh, so really, Yanov unlocked this. And it went on, not just through these sessions, but then in the album that John made with the, the group that came after the Beatles, the Plastic Ono Band, that was meant to be the antithesis of the Beatles, in that they were made of robots, essentially, with sort of ancillary members coming and going. The Plastic Ono Band album is like John's therapy. Well, the last question I'd like to ask is, is one I know that you probably had a billion times, and that is, John Lennon... What was his contribution to our planet during his lifetime? I think it's very simple. He made wonderful music and he made people laugh. Now, to do one of those things is pretty amazing. To do them both is even more amazing. And he ended up as a towering sort of presence at the end of the 20th century, particularly at the end of the 60s, the start of the 70s. He really was seen as a sort of messiah figure for the young on this planet. It didn't come to anything. It was some extent an illusion. John didn't want it to come to anything, but he was man of the decade, he was called in one program, man of the year, Time magazine or one of those polls. He was an extraordinarily dominant figure. Even if that sort of was to some extent sort of the hysteria of the time, the music will, will last and will live. And the memory of this man who could be very mistaken, could be very naive and could even be misguided, but always told the truth as he saw it at the moment. And he really did make people laugh. He added to the jollity of the world. I think Dr. Johnson called it the harmless stock of human merriment. And he's still doing it. People still love John, who weren't even born when he died. Young kids, teenage kids today, know about John Lennon, and they love him. Well, I want to thank you for joining us, uh, Philip. This has uh, been an extraordinary journey for me. I know you've made this journey a five billion times, but Friends of the Book is John Lennon, The Life by Philip Norman, Echo Press, which is an imprint of Harper Collins. New York Times says, nothing less than thrilling, the definitive biography. The Chicago Sun Times says, the best, most detailed, and most serious biography of the Beatles and their time. And certainly I agree with them, and I certainly agree with Uncle Bill Harry here, reading the book. This book brings the John Lennon I knew vividly back to life. 
Thank you ever so much for joining us. My pleasure. Philip. Thank you. Our pleasure, Philip. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Courtner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.